the James A. McKee Association. It's a local nonprofit here in the um, village. We're about 25 years uh, old, and we do a number of uh, what we call civic educational programming, similar to this. It's important that um, each one of you have a card and a, a pencil, because we're asking you to ask your questions. It's important that um, the community have a real voice in this entire process. So if you do not have a card or a pencil, just raise your hands and one of the volunteers will give you one. I want to let everybody know that the um, McKee Association is a um, nonpartisan organization. We do not endorse any individual candidate. We simply provide a platform for all of the candidates to come and um, present themselves to you as the community. This evening we have as our moderator Fred Bartenstein, who many of you hopefully know. He too is a longtime Yellow Springs resident, and his profession is organizational development, helping nonprofits to um, strengthen their activities are in the community. So we want to thank Brad again for joining us. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, with that, what I want to do is turn over the program to Mr. Bartenstein, and he's going to talk to you about ground rules. Uh, well, let's do ground rules. Okay. Ground rules. Uh, they're up on the chart. Karen has made it clear uh, that we're expecting you to send up your questions on 3x5 cards. And if you run out of 3x5 cards, wave your hand and Kate and there may be and Dan will bring you more cards. Uh, if you want to address your question to a particular candidate, and this will only affect the council conversation because the rest of them just have one tonight. Uh, tell, say which one, which person you want to answer. I, if there are similar questions, I'm going to group them uh, so you might not hear your exact language. Uh, all candidates for each office will make a three-minute opening statement. And in Yellow Springs' own version of the Gong Show, there is a 30-second warning that looks like this, candidates. Bob Harris will hold up a sign. And if you're still going in three minutes, you will hear. <laughs> and it's pretty hard to talk over that. So that's pretty much the gong. Uh, and the candidates are going to speak in alphabetical order. So Laura, you're going to be first when we get to council. And the moderator, that's me, is going to read the question, and then the candidate, if it's addressed to one person, will give a two-minute response. If it's addressed to the whole group, as many of them as want to speak, will be given the opportunity, as long as we don't run out of the time for that group. And then, uh, and that's during a 20-minute Q&A period for each office. They have been instructed, the candidates, and I'm instructing them again, that they're not going to respond directly to people that stand up and shout things or say things, that uh, they're going to react to the 3 by 5 cards. Um, okay, any questions about the ground rule? Well, we do are going to begin uh, by having a statement from Mayor Kanai. And who's going to read that? Okay, here comes Katie. Well, 
Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Katie Eggert, and I'll be reading a statement on behalf of Mayor Pam Kenai. Mayor Pam, uh, who usually makes every event, couldn't make this event because she is in Dayton this evening, receiving recognition for her work with WISO Public Radio uh, as a volunteer programmer for the Women in Music program for over 20 years. So two years ago, Pam ran successfully for um, office of mayor on the promise of being a visible and active mayor. Once elected, she instituted regular office hours in the village building on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 1 to 5. She began attending as many village events as her schedule would allow, many. Um, requests for her to perform marriages began on the first day of, of her office. Once on the job, she made contact with village schools, reaching out to volunteer or otherwise be of service to classroom teachers. Within the first month of taking the oath of office, she completed her initial mayor's court training. So how has this all worked out for the village almost two years later? As of this writing, Mayor Pam has logged 883 office hours at the Bryan Center, attended 158 events as mayor, performed 36 weddings, read to two kindergarten classes at Mills Lawn School 52 times, and tutored small groups of students in the fourth and sixth grades. She met with elementary, middle school, and high school classes on 18 additional occasions, issued 45 proclamations, participated in eight ribbon cuttings, and has held 39 Mayor's Court sessions. In addition to keeping her promise to be visible and active mayor, there are two Mayor's Court issues that the mayor is proud to point out and to continue to monitor in her next term. First, starting in May 2018, during her first term, Mayor Pam began following up on the recommendations of the Mayor's Court subgroup of the Village Justice System Task Force. The mayor's office began monitoring all citations issued monthly by the police department to make sure all misdemeanor cases able to be seen by the mayor are indeed sent to mayor's court. Since October of last year, all such cases have been sent there to mayor's court, our mayor's court, 100% of the time. Second. Mayor Pam is also pleased with the response of the Ohio ACLU when she contacted them in August 2018, expressing displeasure with a disparaging video they were circulating concerning Ohio's mayor's courts. What resulted was a series of meetings between policy and legal representatives of the Ohio ACLU and Mayor Pam. With the assistance of village resident Alice Jacobs, these meetings resulted in the Yellow Springs Mayor's Court being cited as an alternative model to many Ohio Mayor's Courts. Mayor Pam has thoroughly enjoyed her first term representing the Village of Yellow Springs and thanks you for the confidence and support sent her way. Thank you. Thank you. Who's running the volume control? Is anyone? I'm not seeing any hands, so we just have to ask every candidate to speak as loudly as you can, because I saw people putting their ears, their hands next to their ears. So I'm going to move this mic up a little closer, and let's keep that in mind. We have, I believe, only one school board candidate here tonight. So, T.J. Turner, if you will come up and make your three-minute presentation. Good evening, everybody. Loud enough? It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the James A. McKee Foundation or Association for, for having us and hosting this evening. Um, so I've been uh, on the school board for the last year or so. I filled in when Sean Crichton uh, moved down to the district. And it's, it's been my absolute pleasure to be How's this? Let's see if this is better. Is this better? Do I sound like him? My brother's name is TJ Turner, but he's not my brother. 
All right. Is that better? Yes. I, I hate putting it anyway, so I'll just stand right here. Easier, Easier to reach me. Um, so, so again, I was on the school board for the past year, and it was, it was my pleasure to, to be there and to serve. Um, I've been in Yellow Springs since 2003. My wife and I uh, moved here, and, and my wife, when uh, we were first living on High Street in an apartment, she started looking for a, a property. And she insisted on being in the Yellow Springs School District. So I, I probably should have realized that at the time that that meant we were having kids. We didn't have kids then. Um, yeah, I wasn't smart enough to realize that that was what the signals were. But uh, she, uh, she found this, this property and her major criteria was that it was in, within Yellow Springs. And she did that because of the schools. She, she wanted to send our kids here. She wanted us to have the, the kind of education that we get from the Yellow Springs Public Schools. And so it, it's, been, uh, again, it's been my honor to be able to be on the board and to help that process. I came from a small town in upstate New York, not unlike Yellow Springs. We had a population that cared about its students and its, its, uh, its children and wanted our schools there to succeed. And uh, I'm here today, I'm a research scientist for the Air Force, and I got my PhD and I got my advanced degrees because of public education. So I had this, this great education that I did not know who I owed it to, and truly it was the entire town and the village. And we live in a place like that. So I know that we, we care about education, we care about our children, and we care about the future. So that's, uh, that's why I'm running for the school board. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a question, and you'll have two minutes to respond to it or less. How do we balance what we want to give our children with what we can afford to give them? Yeah, th th that's a great question. And unfortunately, I'm not going to have a great answer. So I think this, this is a, it's a large community process. I, I, people know me because I was on the committee for the levy on the, the last levy issue. And I was a very vocal uh, supporter of that levy issue. And, and I'll say quite honestly that I did not understand the challenges of affordability that the village had. And I probably still don't. I, uh, you know, I'm fortunate and, and I, have, I love this place we live in. And I realized that, that there's a lot of demands on us. And that's just on the financial side. So trying to balance is, is really a hard issue. So I, I think it's one of engagement. We, we talk, we reach out to the community. We, uh, we do things like the facilities commission that's out there right now. And looking at what the issues are in the schools and maybe trying to come up with some solutions to be able to fix those. Um, and then there's, there's other issues too, and, you know, looking at education and what we want it to be. So one of the great things I've seen in the school district is the, uh, the strategic plan and how we reach out to the community and ask for input. And that it's more than just the facilities. That is you know, what we expect, what our values are, what we want that to be reflected in, in the education that we teach our children. So I think that's a great place for the community to help engage and inform where we're going as a district. You've given some of that information, TJ, uh, in that response, but let me ask the next related question. Beyond attending meetings where the agenda is not detailed, what mechanism will you enact to increase transparency and community engagement? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question. So, um, first and foremost, I think coming to the school board meetings, being able to engage, uh, the community and, and being able to, to talk to board members is, is one big portion. We need that feedback. We need to understand what the community is thinking. Uh, again, we're going to have a new strategic plan coming up. So getting engaged in that and asking, you can always walk in and talk to our superintendent. We have this wonderful new superintendent that we brought on this year. And uh, is that better? Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, so just being able to talk to her and voice, voice concerns, if that's what you're, you're trying to uh, to get across. I, I don't know that there's a lot more to in that. We, we are a very active community and I think that's a great thing. Right? We, we all want to be, be heard and we all want to give input and uh, we need to hear that. We need to get that feedback on, on the school board. There's a number of questions dealing, as you might expect, with the uh, school facilities question. The first one is what would you need to know or what would you need to do before you would be ready to make a decision on the future of the school facilities? 
So we've started this process that, that Mario Basora started before he left, and it started with this facilities task force that's out there. And their initial charge was maybe a little wider than we had initially uh, scoped it, or initially thought that, that we could uh, accomplish. And they were, they were tasked with looking at what the problems were and then trying to come up with solutions. And that's turning out to be a really large charge for this group, and in, to no fault of their own. So what we've now done is we're looking at what the problems are in the school. So this group is made up of a very diverse cross-section, people who uh, favored the last lady, people who didn't, and uh, you know, folks from, from all over Yellow Springs. And so what they're going to do is, is try to look very hard and come to a consensus on what the major issues are. And I think that's the first thing we need to do. We need to recognize what the problems are with the facilities first before we can try to march forward to, to solutions. And you know, affordability is going to be up consideration and how we come up with the solution. And it's just going to take time. It's going to take a lot of outreach to the community trying to figure out what the problems are that are most important for us to be able to address first, and then uh, how we uh, how we then tackle tackle that with a, a real solution for, for the schools. TJ, what are your feelings about new construction versus refurbishing our current building? So I, I don't really have a preference. Um, at the end of the day, we're going to have we're going to come up with the major problems that we're facing, um, at least on the facility side for, for for what the buildings are, and. We're going to have to come up with some solutions that, that are going to be able to address that. I'm, I'm happy if those solutions are new construction. I'm happy if they're renovations. I'm happy if they're a combination. I think what's important in the end is that we come up with a, a truly functioning school for, for our students and one that the community can afford and be proud of. Whatever decision is made regarding building or not, the community could be very divided. What could you do to reconnect and rebuild after a tough decision? Well, I, I think most certainly that starts with transparency. So having a process where everyone is able to be engaged, is able to, uh, to provide their input so that we can, we can incorporate that, so we can hear what all the different uh, demands are in, in terms of, of the community, and then uh, if we can clearly and articulately explain what the issues are and how the problem, how the solutions will, will fix those problems, I think that's that's the very first step. And then beyond that, we just have to uh, keep inviting the community into the schools, have it be part uh, of who we are, which it, they truly are. What should the schools do to improve the maintenance of the existing buildings? Please respond to concerns about currently having a maintenance department of one only. Okay, that's a great question, and it's come up uh, multiple, multiple times. And uh, when the Facilities Commission's been meeting, we've talked a lot about maintenance, and it has been identified as something, a challenge that, that we have in the district, and something that we need to, uh, to do better at, quite frankly. And so, talking to the superintendent, they're going to come up with a long-term maintenance plan. We're going to have to figure out what that's going to require in terms of funding uh, for the schools. And then uh, we're gonna have to to look at where the state of our permanent improvement levies are and, and figure out how we go from there to be able to, to fill that, that gap. I don't know that the maintenance department of one is so much the issue as, as it is having a regularly scheduled plan to do maintenance and not do it at the last minute. We've been running on, um, I don't want to say a shoestring budget, but we've been running on a budget that's lean on purpose so that we are good stewards of the public's money. And what we need to do now is probably do some catch up on some of the things that we haven't been able to maintain to the same degree that we would have liked to up in all these years. The next cluster of, of comments, questions relate to project based learning. Yellow Springs Schools practices a project based learning curriculum. Do you support this method of teaching? And if not, what alternative methods do you recommend? So I absolutely do. I think this is, this is a great question. Um, when I first got here and heard about project-based learning, I was not a fan, of, and I was not supportive of it. And that's because I came from a very traditional educational system. So I sat in a classroom, I, I received instruction, I took tests, and I was much better as a student, just all by myself, not, not in a team dynamic. As I've gotten out to the real world, I've seen that absolutely everything, as a scientist, I'm also a, a reservist for the Air Force, as, as a military officer, Everything I do is team-based. 
And I didn't have those tools that prepared me for any of those careers. And so when I see my children at project-based learning, and they struggle with it, they, they truly are challenged by it at times, it's fantastic. I see them grow more under that system than with any other method of instruction. My, my daughter is doing this project right now in, in social studies where she's learning about the Mexican Revolution and she's, uh, she's doing it from this courtroom perspective. So she's learning about how courtrooms work and how arguments work and how oral arguments work and how you stand up in front of people. And it's, it's just this fantastic growth in her that I see that, that I'm very encouraged by. Um, but I do think that there's some misconceptions about project-based learning in our, in our district. I believe that some folks still have this idea that that's all we do. What it really is, is a construct to help augment our traditional education inside of that spring. So we have a very traditional classroom look and feel. Most of our instruction is, is something that very familiar to me from my days in, in elementary school or in you know, uh, primary schools. Um, but then we do this PBL on top of that education, and it really is that, that extra enhancement that, uh, that I've seen great, great promise with, with my own children. So. Are there students who are not well served by project-based learning? And are there students who need more structured and imposed guidance? I'm certain that there probably are. So everyone learns differently. Everyone learns at their own pace. Everyone learns um, in, in different structures and in, in different environments. For instance, like, like I said before, I probably would not be very good at a project-based learning environment when, when I had gone to school. Um, but what I see with my children, and uh, I have different personalities with my kids. I have a kid in each school, which is, which is fun. So I get to see project-based learning at these different levels. And um, the different personalities of my children is interesting too, because I have one who's a very good team player, one who's much more like me, who likes to do everything because she's a perfectionist. And I've got another one who's just a little bit all over the map, so um, it, it's fun. But you can see that all three of them are benefiting from it. So I see a great benefit for, for everybody. Um, you do have to be careful, I think, though, that uh, you know, the teacher's got to be able to watch that and, and see the dynamic that's going on in these groups. Because if one student um, is, is uh, maybe more dominant in doing it, they can take over and do the project and the others don't get that benefit from it. But that goes along with instruction like, and with anything. So I think when we have fantastic teachers who are well trained, um, and I know that our superintendent is looking about doing a, a refresh for our PBL program to try to make it even more in line with the standards in, in the schools. Um, I, I think that everybody's going to be well served by it, and they're going to come out of this education way more independent, way more able to work on teams to and be great, great team players. So I, I see very little down, downside here. What percentage of the school day is project-based learning? And isn't it much lower than people think? That's kind of what you just said. It, it is much lower. And I don't know that I could give you a, a specific percentage, but it's just a couple of projects a year. And if you do it right and, and do it well, you can tie it together different subjects. And that's what's really interesting, when a couple of teachers to get together and they bring the learning from a couple of different classes you know, into one big project that these kids are working on. It's, it's just fantastic. Um, you know, we, we even saw this with the, the recent bike trip uh, into the wild. My, my son just did that this year, and so he's, he's learning about he's riding his bike, he's getting exercise, and he's doing water sampling projects at the same time. I mean, it's, it's just fantastic to be able to have a, an environment that you can learn in that has, has things like that. And it, it certainly isn't the, uh, the perception is that's all we do is project-based learning, and, and that's just not true. It's, it's a very smaller percentage of the time than, than most people, I think. Uh, or let you believe. TJ, TJ, what's your plan for effectively discouraging students from smoking, drinking, and dangerous drugs? <laughs> so, first off, as, as a school board member, it, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of out of my purview. Um, what we really have is you, you hire great people to, to lead your schools. And that's, you know, Dr. Holden is our new superintendent. Right? She, she's leading the district. And then we have these amazing principals, amazing administrators, and, and then it really is just as much education to the students as possible. Why are the recently released scores of school effectiveness so low comparatively uh, within the state? So th there's, it, it, that's obviously been a, a very 
hot topic of, of debate, our, our recent report cards. Um, and I think that there's several factors there that people haven't been considering. So one, the state tests changed pretty remarkably in 2015. They locked the scores down on, on how they were going to rate the different districts and, and the report cards. And so we're all kind of, I think every district is kind of recovering about what the tests are and how you actually teach to the standards that they are evaluating on these tests. Um, the other part of that is, you know, when we did the 2020 strategic plan, we vocalized as a community to the district that the project-based learning was what we wanted to go after. And we understood if we weren't actively teaching to a test, right? We wanted to have students who can succeed in life. And that doesn't necessarily translate to how you do on a standardized test. So we understood that and we, we took that risk and we, and I think it was a great one to give charge to the district. And then, uh, you know, th there's going to be a learning curve on this. So like I said, Dr. Holden is looking into how we do a refresh on PBL to make certain that we're realigning our, our project-based learning with, with the standards that are taught on those tests so that we can help raise those test scores, um, but do so without having to just teach to the test. That's not the community I think that we are and we want to be. TJ, give us the shortest possible answer to the last two questions. How do we attract and retain highly qualified teachers? Okay, so there's three things. Um, it, it, when I first started getting more involved in, in the school district, my wife's been volunteering for years and I came back from overseas and, and knew about the facilities thing. I met with Mario and Mars Basura, the old uh, superintendent, and he, he pulled out this article and it was really kind of formative for me to look at. There's three major things that, that teachers look at when they want to come to a district. One is the administration. So they need good administrators who support them and, and allow them the flexibility to, to teach their students. Two was the facilities. So having good facilities that they could teach in that mirrored the modern day learning that they were trying to put in place. And then number three was their salary. So it's, it's really important to have those, those three things. I think we do, we do well. Across the board, we're having some challenges with the uh, facilities more than anything else. I, I love our administration. I think it's, it's fantastic. Uh, we just came out of salary negotiations with the teachers, but what I'm, what I'm, uh, I think one of the things we'll need to focus on is our facilities. Last question. What can we do to address the concern in the community that the needs of the poorer and minority students are not being addressed well? So that, that's a question that probably goes well beyond the school board, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of things there. And, and one of the most important elements, I think, for a society like ours in this country is a public education. And we're, we're a progressive town. That's why I live here. I, I love this place. And we lean forward and we like, we support education. And really, one of the only places, I think, foundational parts of our society to be able to raise yourself up is to have a good education. That, that, that's what my experience was. I have other privileges, obviously, but just having that great education got me to where I am today. And so, you know, the, the best serving our, our minority and our and poor students is to deliver the best education we can to give them the best chances they have in this world so that they can they can get ahead and become the, the best version of themselves. Let's acknowledge candidate TJ Turner. Uh, let's get all of the Village Council candidates to come up. Laura Curlis, Dino Pilato, Jim Johnson, Marianne McQueen, Lisa Krieger, and then you can sit in your alphabetical order if you can figure that out. But we know Laura is first, Jim is second, Lisa is third, Marianne is fourth, and Dino is fifth. Laura, you're on. Thank you very much, and thank you to the James McKee Society. Um, I'm running for council. Um, I think I can make a difference in the community. I've got over 12 years of experience in local government work as a lawyer, um, as a village administrator, and two years as village manager here. So I know quite a bit about local government. Uh, the Yale Springs News asked me, uh, you know, how am I, I going to make the village better? Well, I'm not really 
going to make the village better, you're going to make the village better. What I think local government does is we make sure the streets are paved, the water is clean, the sewer does what it needs to do. We make sure the basics of life are delivered to you in as cost effective a manner as possible. If we do that, that is huge. Because I know how hard that is to do. So, for example, I spent not maybe 20 minutes, and here's my list of things that I see as priorities for the village. To prioritize infrastructure projects. That alone will consume hours and hours of everyone's time. Prioritize budget review, budget adjustments, examining. Uh, there's an upcoming municipal levy request. Do we need all that money? Can we cut some things? Uh, everybody who lives in Yale Springs knows affordability is a multi-pronged um, notion because it's not only the housing and the cost, but it's taxation, utilities, and things like that. I'd like to start a discussion on strengthening checks and balances in government, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. We definitely, as we heard tonight, uh, the Brene property is becoming more up to the forefront. A lot of citizens already knew that, but now because of where the EPA is in the process, it will become even more critical. I think from counts, I mean, there's so many aspects of it that are critical, so I'm not putting priority of one over the other, but probably the most critical is um, the protection of our groundwater and implementing a source water uh, protection plan so that we just build a $7.2 million water plan. Uh, we don't want the wells contaminated. I'd like to see uh, these sanitary sewer overflows stopped. So it's, when the sanitary overflows, where does it go? It goes into the Glen and pollutes the Little Miami River. Preserve more green space, improve our parks, continue with the streets and pedestrian improvements, that I, some of which I started, the curb ramps, the sidewalk improvement, trails, safe routes to school, connectivity. Uh, continue implementing police community improvements, training for officers, implement the recommendations of the Justice System Task Force and the vision for policing. Uh, I'd like to talk more about what local government can do to reduce mass incarceration. You have no idea, if you don't study this issue, the collateral effects, long-lasting, on people's lives from even the smallest misdemeanors. So anyway, I, I'll have a lot more to say if I get some more time, but thank you very much and I ask for your vote on November 5th. Jim Johnson, you're next. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Good to see you here. Hi, um, your okay. Um, I'm running for village council because I love my hometown. Um, I've loved living here since growing up. Uh, since growing up here in the 70s and 60s and 70s, uh, and since moving back uh, in 2012. Um, I believe I'm qualified because um, I, I grew up here. I graduated from high school in 78, 1978. I went to Miami University. I got a political science degree. Um, uh, I then uh, worked for Mike DeWine for a couple years and got to know not only the government from the federal level, but also from the uh, county and, and uh, local level, because I interacted as Mike's uh, district representative, I interacted with uh, uh, with local government officials. Um, after working for Mike, I worked. Uh, I went to law school, um, so I understand uh, the law and how it impacts um, uh, the local governments. Um, the, uh, the the one uh, issue that I'm most uh, uh, most concerned about is economic development. I believe in spreading the cost of of village government around. I think we are uh, too dependent on. Um, the residents who, who live here. When I, when I was growing up here, we had a, a much broader economic base to, uh, to rely on. And not, not only brought in tax revenue, but that provided good jobs. Um, uh, a good uh, 60, 65% of uh, my classmates, their, their families were able to work and live here. Um, 
I think so that's, uh, that's no longer the case. Uh, and um, I, I don't think that's a good trend. I would like to see more, um, uh, more job opportunities in town so families could live and work in town. Um, and again, that, uh, that's the, I think, of the, the tradition of Yellow Springs. Uh, um, uh, I also uh, would like to see uh, the village uh, work on renewable energy and bringing more renewable energy local. We, uh, we have made a commitment to using uh, renewable energy in our, as, a, as our electric source. Um, but I think we're bringing that from, from far, uh, and that's more expensive. If we could focus on um, developing uh, uh, solar energy, uh, like Antioch College is doing, building on that, um, that is something that I would like to, uh, like to, see, uh, to see happen. Collaborating with the college is, is also uh, something that I, I would uh, try to Try to implement. Um, our histories are linked, and uh, I think our future could also be, be linked. Um, after law school, I didn't pursue a, a career in law, or I didn't stay in politics. I went into higher education. Um, I was a higher education administrator that focused on fundraising. I know the value of good relations with institutions of higher education and the impact that uh, they can have on the local, local economy. Um, we are blessed to have Antioch College here, as well as Antioch Midwest, but we, within a half hour drive, we have a dozen institutions of higher education that we could collaborate with to help drive the economy. Um, and that, uh, uh, that is something that my background can, uh, can help do. And uh, again, I, um, I thank you all for being here. Uh, I am uh, I'm pleased to be able to, to run. It's, uh, it's my, um, uh, it, it's my, I think I believe have the time and interest uh, to serve. And um, I would I'd like, I'd at least like to try. So um, I appreciate your, your attention and also appreciate your vote. Thank you. I understand that we have someone who will present for Lisa Krieger. Good evening. My name is Todd Krieger, and I'm proud to be representing my wife, Lisa Krieger, and to read her candidate statement. So here we go. I was disappointed when I discovered that I would not be able to attend the candidate night because today I am speaking at a conference in California. The title of my presentation is, You're Different From Me, and That's Why We're Great. That certainly fits with the context of the Village of Yellow Springs. Although we have differences, working together, we can accomplish village goals. I've spent the majority of my career doing work that prepared me to be your council person. For over 20 years, I've helped individuals, teams, and organizations collaborate to be more effective. My PhD in Leadership and Change from Antioch University helped to further grow my skills as a thoughtful servant leader. Serving on the council is not easy. It comes with difficult choices. I've learned that the community and the council are in a partnership. You count on me to listen to you and be fully informed, and I count on you to not only critique, but to also engage in generating ideas and solutions. My focus as your council person has been and will remain on fiscal responsibility, infrastructure planning, and economic development. These three related issues are the most critical. To highlight some successful strategies, I've improved strategic planning for infrastructure investments resulting in more effective budgeting and forecasting practices led the charge to establish the Yellow Springs Community Development Corporation that brings together the village, township, school board, chamber, community foundation, and Antioch College for strategic collaboration and coordinated investment that drives economic development. My background as a coalition builder is very important to these sorts of projects. 
have led changes in policies that have quadrupled the village's return on investment. Launched the Utility Roundup Program. Have you opted in? I remained actively engaged in justice system work through the police assessment while beginning to explore how our government and council can contribute to the overall health of our community. Finally, I'll address the question about the Charter Amendment. I took an active role in one aspect of the amendment, that is promoting, promoting the change in the mayor's term from two to four years. Continuity is the most important in these roles to optimize our impact. It was an administrative error to combine all issues, and if the amendment fails, I would support placing the elements of the amendment on the ballot as separate changes. Regarding voting rights, I have taken the time to listen to both sides of the debate and stand with my decision to vote yes to place this on the ballot so that you can decide. If you choose to vote yes, the implement the impact will be more inclusionary participation in our local political system with negligible burden or cost as a result of the changed process. Thank you to the James A. McKee Association for hosting this forum and for allowing me to provide a statement in absentia, Lisa Creek. Todd, uh, we're going to ask to stand down from the from the stage because the ground rules don't uh, permit him to participate in the Q&A. Thanks, Todd. Uh, next is Marianne McQueen. Do I? Good evening, and thank you for coming tonight, and thanks to the McKee Group for hosting this event. I'm running for re-election to Village Council and would like to share a few thoughts with you. I think council members have three main tasks. One, listening and responding to the diverse concerns of our community members. Two, supporting village staff who carry out most of the actual work of the village government. And three, being willing to disagree with each other and at the same time work together. I strive to do that. The fundamental work of village government is to provide the basic services effectively and at reasonable cost. Over the past year, our village staff has developed a five-year planning process tied to the village budget that includes the upgrades and repairs needed for our utilities, our basic services and buildings. This has been a critical step that I support. In the past, it may have been enough for council to focus only on the basics. That is no longer true. Here are a few promising projects that I want to encourage. One, the cleanup of the Verne property and the grounds and groundwater for the safety of the village and to enable the property to be repurposed for future use. Two, the potential for a public-private partnership for the community broadband. Three, a mixed income housing development on the glass farm that will provide more housing options for young adults, families, and seniors. And four, the Yellow Springs Community Development Corporation that will enable the village, the township, the Yellow Springs schools, and the Antioch College to collaborate together and provide more options for economic development. I'm excited about these initiatives, and at the same time, I realize that there have been times when council has acted too fast without enough community input and outreach. We need better channels of communication between village government and villagers. If re-elected, I will make this a priority. I do support the Vote 16 Amendment that would allow 16 and 17-year-old residents to vote in local elections. Given the global and national threats that our youth will face, the more we can prepare them to be engaged public citizens are better. I'm also comfortable enabling residents 
who are not U.S. citizens to vote in Yellow Springs issues. If you have questions, concerns, or ideas, pick up my flyer and information at the back of the room, and I'd be happy to talk more with you. Thank you. Dino Pilato. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Karen, for putting on the show tonight for us. Uh, we appreciate it. I am Dino Pilata, your right hand candidate, D E A N Pilata. <laughs> very easy to do. I've got information in the back on how to do right in. It's very easy this year. We're on tablets. Um, owner of Dino's Cappuccinos for 21 and a half years. We moved here to Yellow Springs in 2012. So we've been an active member with council, with the village, just integrate it all with everybody. So we have a good feel for what goes on and how we, are, how we work within the village. Um, reasons that I wanted to be part of this is because I, I'm in part of the planning commission right now as an alternate member, I'm sitting on as permanent for, at the moment. And I'm also part of the steering, steering committee with regards to the land, the comprehensive land use plan. This is my passion right now, is this, this, the land use plan. It's gonna give us guidance, it's a playbook that's gonna push us in the direction that's gonna help us achieve infrastructure needs, that's gonna help us achieve business needs, housing needs, and also address our seniors, which are all part of, our, of, the, of the mix of what goes on in Yellow Springs, and of course, affordability is, is the biggest part of this. What we have in the steering committee is we're, we're identifying these ideas, we want more involvement from the community so that we can plan ahead to achieve infrastructure, so that we can achieve housing, so that we can achieve more business. What we always find is that there's an affordability issue here. That's our bottom line. That's our biggest issue that we all, that we all can agree upon. And there's ways to get at it. There's, there's, as I think the other folks have said, there's other little layers of how you get to affordability. But what I try to look at is that on the affordability side, if we can have a blend of housing and business, we're going to be able to bring more tax revenue into the, into the village. And that's our driving force. This is what's really driving us. Our, we have strong seniors. We're at 56%, I think we're at 30, I'm sorry, we're at 36% that are over 65. We're at 50% that are over 55. And then we have a lower side when we're looking at, the other side when we're looking at affordable housing. You're trying to get, you're trying to get starter homes in there. You're trying to get young people in to, to understand, to be part of the community. So you have these two, you have these two areas, and what we need to do is bring them together. There's a middle area that we have where we're hitting the residents, the, the workers, uh, the, mid, the, the businesses, uh, small businesses. We're all here to, to bring this into fruition. And I'll get into that more as, I t as we talk longer. Um, as far as the issue, the charter issue, I am emphatically against it. I've spoken about it at the McKee, at the McKee group. Uh, at the way that it's set up, it's set up improperly. It's, it's not proper. The process was done wrong. We all get that. It's better to vote no now. We'll address it come uh, March during the during our primaries. It'll be better off for us. So thank you. Okay, there are a ton of questions. I guarantee you there are more than we can get to, but I will leave them all at the end so you will know, and maybe uh, the Yellow Springs News will pick up on this and the candidates can address them, if only in letters to the editor. I'm going to start with the question, and, and I'm going to hand you this mic so that you can pass it down the line for, I'm going to start with the questions that are addressed to only one person. Jim Johnson, how do your past skills prepare you for this office, particularly economic development? Well, uh, working in higher education, one of, the, um, one of the talking points that we often uh, use with with donors uh, and corporations that we were seeking uh, support from was the, uh, the value that the research that was being done, uh, the teaching that was being done, um, the, the value that that had for the 
the local community, the a region, the state, even the nation. Um, uh, so that, my, my higher education background um, uh, would, would allow me to interact with the institutions around this region. And I believe that's one of the areas that we could really uh, work on, is reaching out to Wright State, Wittenberg, uh, University of Dayton, um, some of the major uh, institutions that have a good, solid research going on where there's uh, projects being incubated in the laboratories, and if they fit uh, what, we can, what we can provide in terms of resources, um, we, should, we should be able to encourage them to think about moving the startup enterprise into, into the village. Um, so my uh, background in, in higher education, I think, would, um, would allow that. Uh, I believe my background in, in uh, um, working for uh, the congressman in, in uh, his district office, I, uh, I interacted often with uh, village, um, uh, village council members around his district, not just in Yellow Springs, but from, he had his district from Marion all the way down to Circleville. Um, and I worked with Calvin. Thank you. Uh, Jim, this question calls for a one-word response. Can you assure us that you would be functional at the council meetings? Yes. Okay, next question. Dean, would you pass the mic down to Dean? I am worried about conflict of interest with your wife's realty business, like with the decision to build more residents that could sell for top dollar. Can you respond to that? Absolutely. That would be a hypothetical question and we would address it when the time comes, should I be on counsel. We have legal counsel that we would address it with. I would go to legal counsel and ask them and see if it fits or if I need to recuse myself. And that's what we would deal with. But at this point, as a hypothetical, I'm not gonna, I, I don't have an answer until we have legal counsel to, to talk that with, talk through with them, and to see if that is the proper thing for me to do. This is a question for Jim and Laura. Why did you choose to not respond to the League of Women Voters for the Voters Guide? Um, I was uh, unaware. Uh, I did not get a notice about it. I um, I have put a response up on my uh, my website. Um, again, I, I just was uh, I didn't have notification and I missed it. I um, I did. Uh, fill out the, uh, uh, the questionnaire, and the Big Bailey News also has a uh, candidate uh, 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 forum, and I missed that, but I, I, I have since uh, put it up on their website. So um, it's just a matter of not being able to catch all the things that you, uh, you can do in a, in a campaign. That's a great question, because when I finally found the email in my spam, I had like one day to answer it, and it, they didn't give me, I didn't have enough time. And I, I thought about talking to the league about giving the candidates more time to answer questions. Um, I did fill it out the year, the year before. I think I got a letter in the mail about it. But this is a danger with email, so um, yeah, I would have answered it if I'd had more time and, and had it brought to my attention. Marianne, what are your th top three priorities for the next term? I'm the lead council person on housing, and so I would say my top priority that I personally will be working on with the village manager and with our advisory board is to finalize a housing plan for the whole village, and in particular, begin the concept plan for mixed income housing on the glass farm. The second priority that I have and that I stated is to, to develop more effective ways of communicating from village government to the community and back and forth. I think the recent issue with the vote 16 uh, and also the traffic change have exemplified that there wasn't enough communication back and forth with the community before either of those 
came either vote or for the trial. And given given the state that we're in at the national level with such polarization and such misinformation and so much information, and that we also really have here too, I think, with social media and the hyperness of that and the tendency to assume negative intent a lot of times. I think that the village government needs to be working on finding how can we be effective? How, you, well, for example, we, we spent seven hours working on the budget uh, a couple weeks ago in the last council meeting. We talked about the budget and I think we had maybe one citizen there for that. And yet, you know, there's not a whole lot that is uh, more important than our overall budget. So how, how can we incentivize, how can we make our budget exciting? And actually, we're, we're thinking about that. Um, so those are going to be my two priorities. And there's lots of other stuff I'm interested in. I'm interested in the active transportation plan. I'm very excited about the Yellow Springs Community Development Corporation. I am the lead person on the Environmental Commission, and we have a number of projects. We've been working on the Verne, we worked on the Glass Farm, we're working on uh, trying to figure out how can we have more recycling, how can we have a bit, uh, lower carbon footprint. So there, there's no end of things in village government to be, for me to be interested in. But I think the two priorities are housing and really being more effective between council, the village government, and you. Thank you. Uh, the, the rest of the questions are addressed to everyone. And in order to do this most efficiently, my suggestion is if you agree with what somebody's saying, kind of go <laughs> this way so that you don't have to say it again. If you firmly disagree, We'll give you the mic next, uh, just so that we can get as many different perspectives as possible. What's the most important job of the council representatives? Is it managing our public utilities, policing, uh, planning, zoning, business, local economy, affordability, housing issues, or something else? What's the most important job of council representatives? I'm holding on the mic. Well, I, I, I said what I thought the three important jobs are, and uh, I don't think we can clearly, we have to represent well what you all want and what we feel are important for the community. We also need to choose the village manager and support our village staff. And it's great that we have five people on council because each person brings their own perspective and they're gonna champion some things and we're gonna hopefully disagree. And at the same time, it's not enough to just disagree. Then we have to figure out how can we work together on things. And those, being able to disagree and work together, that, that's, that's very important to do. And so those are the three things. I'm not going to just say one. Okay. And anyone else who would like to answer the question, what's the most important job of council representatives? So as I'm seeing it right now, affordability is going to be my buzzword. That's what we continually look at. And, and being on the business, uh, we haven't had a business person on, on village council for a lot. Um, what I want to bring to the table is talk about business. It, by affordability, by bringing business in, we give another option uh, that's going to give us a, a, a that's going to give us a tax revenue stream that we are not fully going after. Dayton Health Service, Cresco, those are the two newest large businesses that are here. If we can attract more businesses that fit our core values that are going to be with what we're looking for, this revenue stream is going to help us reach reach out for lower utilities. We're gonna reach out, we're gonna have money coming in on, on income tax, on property tax. Uh, those are the, on payroll tax. These are what we're looking for that can help us, that can free us up, that gives us monies, and then in turn frees us up to do 
social programs that will have more money available. If you don't have margin, you can't achieve your goals. So this is the side that I want to attract, is really start looking at businesses that fit our community, larger businesses. They're going to be high tech, if it's going to be um, call centers, something of those nature that are good sized businesses that could just help, that are going to, be, that are going to add to our bottom line and free us up. <coughs> I believe uh, that local government is the purest form of representative democracy. So your council members are your, um, uh, reflect your, your views. And I would make sure that I am available and, and you would have my phone number and my email and I would even like the mayor has done, I have office hours. Uh, so being your representative on council and, and uh, working for you on, um, on your behalf with, uh, with local government is, is the main, um, the main function of uh, village council. Uh, so as I said, my campaign is about getting things done and focusing on the basics of government. With that said, from the 30,000 foot view, having a community discussion about demographics, I think is really important because I've heard studies done maybe through the schools that you know, the, I, I understand about the population trend, we're 50% over the age of 55, I'm in that group, but that our school age population is going down, and is, is that going to last for a long time? Is that trend going to reverse? If it continues to go down, what does that mean for the schools? Do we have two schools? Do we have one? Do we have none? I'm not suggesting none. <laughs> I'm, I know how important education is to this community as it is to me. Um, but I'm just saying, I think we have to have an honest conversation about demographics and what that means for public policy. The second thing, and I talked about this in, in the justice system task force uh, meetings, which I attended, is more effective executive government. And what I mean by that is you all know when crises happen here, there's a huge amount of frustration because things don't seem to happen. We study it, we talk about it, we study it some more, we pay a lot of money for studies and nothing happens, right? Why is this? I could tell you why it is, but largely I believe it's because we do not have a mayor who is head of the executive branch who's, who is accountable to all of you, who's elected by you, and if that mayor, who is head of the executive branch, not council, most governments, council is largely legislative, and we hold the purse strings. That's, what, that's the brilliance of American government. Checks and balances, three-part government. We more or less have two-part government here. Not even, because our, our judicial branch has such a small role that that would be, the mayor's really a judicial officer. The mayor is not in charge of the executive branch. So I've introduced a wild idea, but I think if you think about it, it will result in a lot more power to the people in terms of, of controlling the executive branch of government. Thank you. Uh, we'll keep the mic on your side. All uh, candidates for council, and Dean, I think you've answered this question already. What are your ideas for developing the tax base for our village, other than increased housing? I'll make, should it, are we all in a chance? Yeah, yeah I, I think Dino's right on. I mean, economic development, because we need good, we don't just want to be a bedroom community for other places. We want to have good jobs here. So that's an important thing. The CDC is the right way to go. In my past lives, they did a lot of work with a CIC, which is the same thing. It gets called CIC, CDC. Um, they're very effective tools, and I, I do applaud council for going in that direction. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, economic, economic development is the, uh, is the cornerstone to it, improving the, the, um, the, the revenue, uh, the tax revenue. Um, and I, I would like to bring in the, um, the broadband, the community broadband. I think that would be one of the economic engines that, that could, uh, could bring more business. Uh, it could, could, there could be uh, home-operated uh, home uh, businesses that uh, could be uh, attracted here. 
ask you if we, if we had that and I'd like to you know, further explore that as a as a goal for the community going forward. There are limits to what village government and especially small government can do for economic development. True. The, the simplest thing we can do is have zoning that encourages it and allows it. And I would agree both with the community broadband, probably one of our most effective um, outreach ways is to encourage the entrepreneurial spirit that we already have here. Community broadband, I think, would be one way of doing that, allowing people many of whom already we have, to be able to work from home, to start, to start small businesses. Also, the Community Development Corporation, I agree. Hey, Mark, okay. This is a drill down question on that one. It is easy to argue for the need to strengthen business and tax revenues in Yellow Springs, but how exactly would you go about that? What features of Yellow Springs make it or would make it attractive for new business and i've heard cdc broadband entrepreneurial spirit and zoning is there anything else any of you would like to mention sure i'd like to work with the chamber of commerce that's their that's their go-to uh, they can they're the outreach they're the arm that reaches out that could attract uh, that could sell yellow springs I mean, we all have our limits on council but that is the focus of our chamber is to outreach so if they're in the Miami Valley, um, in the regional board meetings, if they're involved with those kind of things, if they're putting us out there, if they're putting Yellow Springs out there, look, we've got availability out here. We've got land out here. We've got, we, you know, the things that we bring to the table, our core values that we can address, that people look to us, that businesses can look to us. That's what the purpose of the chamber is. And that's what I would, I would rely on the chamber to, to be that outreach. You know, if this were easy, it would have been done. I mean, this, this is a problem, and we've been talking about it for at least the past couple decades. I, the chamber is doing this, and I see Karen sitting back there. I mean, I think it was largely Karen's work that got, um, that got the Dayton mailing service here. So, yeah, working with the chamber and the Community Improvement Corporation, but, you know, it's tough to do. It's not... It's, I don't want to oversell our ability to do that. Okay. Laura, did you yeah. want to say something? Um, so I lived through the um, 2008 DHL pullout in Wilmington when 10,000 people lost their jobs, and we had an economic crisis. And believe it or not, one thing that helped was people coming together and having conversations. For example, can we put up an idea board in the Emporium? Like, when you go in and buy your coffee, what's your best idea for revitalizing our local community? Another thing we did is we got grants to help people retool, retrain, relocate. A third thing, and this was run through the CDC, uh, our CIC, was, um, believe it or not, infrastructure grants targeted at the downtown, and I managed 60 building improvement projects. Now you might think, how does that help business? But believe me, when you have crumbling buildings, which we do, and you start to improve them, miraculous things happen. And I can give you story after story about that, of new businesses that started, or businesses that thought, oh, how are we ever gonna afford to put a new roof? And when they put a new roof and then redid their windows, the customers were happy, they were happier. It like, it really helped a lot, and Wilming, downtown Wilmington is still alive and thriving today. So that's, um, that's then there's some, I have a lot of ideas, and that's one of my hallmarks. I have a lot of ideas. I think some of them are good and can benefit the village. These, this is a, a, another follow-up question on that same topic to Dino and Jim specifically. Would you be in favor of tax breaks to entice businesses? Uh, I would in the short term, but I think it has to, you know, really has to be weighed. <coughs> what, what is the benefit they're they're bringing? What what uh, size of um, uh, what's, what is their size of operation? Um, I wouldn't completely eliminate their their, their tax uh, obligation, but um, it would be a negotiation that we would have, and it would depend on um, 
the value they would bring. Um, you know, I think um, uh, DMS is a, is, a good, is a good example of, of a company that brought a lot of value. Um, and, a, and if a company of, of that size can attract another company of that size, then um, let's, uh, let's have a, you know, it's part of a negotiation. Let's have a, a, a candid uh, uh, conversation and, and, um, and the, get, get the input from the village too. Uh, make sure that the villagers know what we're talking about, what, what, is, in the, uh, what is in the pipeline and what, what the possibilities are. Dean, this was specifically addressed to you as well. Yes, yeah, so I agree with Jim with what we're saying. It is important that we could use a negotiating tool of a tax abatement, but there's a, always a cost of benefit analysis. What are they going to bring to the table dollar-wise? What are we going to lose dollar-wise? Are we going to come out ahead or are we going to be behind? How long is this abatement going to be if we're going to present something like that? Um, payroll taxes, the amount of people that are going to come in. Those are the things that we, we have to look at the size of the business. Look, live here, work here. If you live here, your taxes, and live here, work here, your taxes, your payroll taxes are staying here. We're not separating, they're not going out to another community. These are all little issues that come together. So whether you want to give it abatement for a, a length of time, that's what we would have to determine. It's going to be the cost benefit. I mean, if we're upside down on it, and it may be the, you know, that we really want this business, like, you know, we, all business is not good business. And sometimes you have to say no, you have to walk away from the deal. So that's what my take would be. We'd have to do our research, our due diligence, and see if it's a fit. I have four questions here that all relate to attracting and retaining a diverse population. I'm going to read them all, and then I'll go back and give that same cap again. You are all white citizens, and I assume wealthy, and also of a certain age. How well do you think you understand the question of affordability for younger families in the village? Give examples of your experience with unaffordability. What would you do to get more younger families in the village? We need tax-paying individuals that will populate our schools. And what are the ideal demographics for Yellow Springs? Is it a larger population, more diversity, more or less working class families? What would you like to see more or less of and how would you affect that? So this is the diverse population. What can village council do? So, diversity, what I have seen or what I have thought about this on this subject is that we were well ahead of the curve back in the 60s, 70s. We were well ahead and, and we were diverse. We were an open population. We brought in, everybody looked to us to come into the village. It was a, it was a place, a safe haven, if you will, but it was an open, it was an open village. So as time has gone by, we have had, you know, let's take Columbus for example, or Cincinnati, or any big cities. They have caught up with us. We are not, the, they've caught up with diversity, that they're looking at diversity, that is part of their, it's part of their culture. And it's part of what helps them grow. So what I look at now is what's going to separate us to the next level. We have to take what is going to be the next step for us to, to stand out. How do we stand out? What do we need to do to stand out to, to attract uh, diversity? Our challenges are our schools at this point in time. We, you know, we just looked at our school since we got our ratings. We understand that's part of our, a part of our deal. Uh, people want to come for schools. They want to come and be affordable. And you know, again, as I've mentioned, we're not in an affordable place at this point in time. And that's the things that we need to work on to really stretch us to look at affordability and the op the ways that we can attract young, the ways that we can we have an aging group that that are you know again we said 36 percent are over 65. We have to make these transitions and embrace them to say, and, and that's a tough question. How are we going to reach out to them? And that's where our difficulty is is taking that next step. And that's the benefit of being on council is that. We could be a brain trust, we could work through this, we could share ideas, and then, you know, you come up with a, with a game plan. And, you know, I don't have all the answers, no one has all the answers, but that's the benefit of working together, that we can come up 
with a, with a game plan. And again, that goes back to our comp plan that we're doing right now that needs to be, that needs to be addressed, because that is one of the issues that was on our comp plan, the comp plan, the comp plan is planned. I am a white, and I am an elder. I am a lesbian. I am not rich. I've never been rich. I, I mean, at least according to uh, the standards in this country. So I've always been low income. I've always been able to, uh, well, I've always worked here, and I've always managed to, you know, do little this, this, and this, and this in order to be able to work here. So I truly understand uh, the affordability issue. And when I moved here, I rented what is now the Dharma Center for $100 a month. And then I had Antioch students live with me, so it was $25 a month that I paid. So, you know, that place would now be at least $1,000 a month. So I, I get it personally. I, I live that. Um, in terms of how we, what, what I think our goal should be in terms of adjusting age, re, regarding age demographics, what the housing group, what our discussions have been working from our housing needs assessment is to try and move toward the age demographics of our region. So that would be increasing the number of children, the number of young adults. I mean, we're not clearly this is such a desirable place to live that people like myself and I see friends out there and other colleagues, we want to continue to live here. So, so you know, we're not going to, I mean, us older people will be pushed out by natural causes. <laughs> we're not going to try and push, push them out. Um, so the goal of increasing younger people and, and truly the way to do that is by having housing that people can afford and that meets their needs. And that is why housing is so critical and as probably people are aware, still very contentious. The Chamber and Home Inc. and three, the 365 Project have been working on developing an affirmative marketing plan to attract especially African Americans. And, you know, at one time, Yellow Springs had a larger African American population, about 30%, I think. When I moved here, that was about what it was. But as the country has changed, and African Americans, and, you know, I, I hesitate speaking. I mean, you know, I'm white. I can't really speak for African American people, but my sense is that they they were able to leave, and they, there are other places that they can live. So uh, now we are what we are. Uh, I think the one other thing that I think we might start thinking of is being willing to start considering expanding our geographic boundaries. Um, I love Yellow Springs being small. I love us being a village. but. We have gotten trapped, I think, in this sort of thing of just say no, no change, nothing. And that has led us to where we are. So I think we need to be able to sort of shake ourselves up and pull ourselves into this century. <clears throat> I think we should um, take great pride in our, our history and our diversity and, and uh, uh, promote that. Um, one of the uh, responsibility of the council is to be uh, be cheerleaders for our uh, for our town, and that is one of the that our our history of, of diversity in, uh, is is something that we um, is, it's, it's in our soul, and we uh, we should promote that um, to to attract a younger uh, population. I, I think it all comes down to good jobs and good housing. Um, I, I agree. It's um, I think our, our I think we're pretty well protected with uh, by working with Tecumseh Land Trust. They have they have uh, done a good job I think in in uh, uh, taking the farmland around us and making sure it's in a uh, a trust that it, so it can't be developed. If there is a land that could be developed around here, um, I don't I'm not afraid of uh, developing outside of what you know what we have. Uh, have developed in terms of, of homes. Um, so, uh, yeah, like, again, take, let, let's take a look at our history and promote that. 
You know, I, I don't have any, e there are no easy answers. Um, each of us can certainly help. I'm on a board uh, where I'm the only woman. We're all white, all the rest of the board are men. And every time a board position comes open, I say, can we all stretch our minds and think of somebody who doesn't look like us for this board, please? Because if you don't think of bringing in those people, your friends who are diverse, different from you, they're not going to come. You know, you know, you might know that a house is going to come up for sale. Who do you call? I'm just saying we all have a role to play. I try to think of diverse people who said, oh, I'd love to live in Yellow Springs, you know, and, and try to call those people. So you all know who, who they are, try to help market the village. I think the fact that we are branded um, as a socially liberal place is really important because that means we're a welcoming place. That means that people, they, and, and I hope we each can live out those ideals. I love those signs that say, hate has no home here. Can we all live out those ideals? Then people want to come. Now, a couple of houses on my street just turned over, and they turned over with a mixed race family and then an African American family. I do not, and they were people who could easily afford those houses. I'm not presuming that we have to go low income to bring in a, a variety of racial groups, right? So um, I'm going to focus on developing moderate um, income housing. When I was village manager here, I wanted to rent an apartment. I'm like, oh yeah, I'll rent an apartment. My husband's job had kept him in, in a different place. We'll have two places on an apartment. There were no market rate nice apartments to rent. And so then I thought my second strategy is I'm going to just do Airbnb and the, um, the bed and breakfast when I need to be in town. And so that's what I did, because I didn't want to get into a long-term lease at a place I didn't want. So anyway, I think mod market rate, nice apartments that, we, that can cater to a lot of different groups, young families, single, older people, and then uh, condominiums that are in that $150,000 to $200,000 range. I see, and the housing assessment said that too. That's a huge note, and I would focus on that. Karen, we have two more minutes in this section. I think we can add five without doing damage to the uh, township. I think you're right. All right, we'll add five more minutes to this segment. Uh, the next series of questions relate to affordable housing, and I will read them all. If affordable housing is done on the glass farm, how do you foresee the village contributing financially to that effort? What do you actually propose to do to make a difference in housing? Uh, affordability is a growing issue. Please discuss which pieces you see as priority for addressing this concern. Can affordable housing be achieved without driving down property values or increasing population? Uh, when the village was talking about redoing the zoning code in 2012, the thing, I, I, I was new here at that time, and I kept thinking to myself, everybody says they want to be a village, and yet we're, we're changing the zoning code to add more density, which means more easily gaining population. You know, in Ohio, once you hit 5,000, you're a city, and there's a whole other set of laws that come into effect and govern you. Uh, do you want to be a do people want to be a village or not? So that's one that goes back to my demographics discussion question. Um, in general, I I would have to be convinced to put housing on Glass Farm. I read the 2010 visioning statement that Miami Township and the village did with a study of Glass Farm. People forget about these studies we did and what they say. The soils there are terrible. Um, they're very hydric, they drain that whole area. And even though part of it was preserved, the rest of those soils are not really the best. I mean, they're actually more suitable for a natural area. So, um, you can't necessarily, not everywhere should be built on. Um, I'm generally not in favor of expanding the boundaries because I think there's a lot of infill that can happen still, and I think we still have areas that eventually will be built on.
but it, preserving a green space is really important around the village because if you don't, if you don't, Fairborn will be right, you know, about a stone's throw away. So um, I think the qual people like the quality of life as a, as a village. I think that's what pe attracts people here. The CDC will be able to help a lot with developing moderate income housing. The thing a CDC can do if you say give them some land, they can work with developers to develop that land in a way that will reach some of these goals. The, the thing that holds up hold, home inc sometimes is that they have the grants they go after determine what they build. I'd like to see the village grow, but I don't think I'd like to see the village grow beyond that. The city size, but I, we're, we're a population of about 4,000. When I was uh, when I was growing up here, we were just under 5,000. Uh, that takes into the fact that we had a college that you know, had a had a full complement of uh, a couple thousand students too. Um, but uh, I um, I'm more concerned about uh, building good housing uh, and uh, uh, a mixed a mixed range of of housing stock. I think it's important to, to provide um, good housing <laughs> uh, and increase that, uh, increase that stock, uh, the availability of, of good housing around that. There are a number of areas in the village where housing could be developed. There's only one parcel that is controlled by the village. There's not a lot we can do. To, we cannot demand a private develop, a private landowner to develop housing. There is, however, property adjacent to the glass farm, which potentially is uh, going to be available for housing development. In regard to the, the glass farm site itself, it's true the, the soil is permeable, the water table is high, but you know what, anyone who lives in the village, uh, you probably know that from your own house. So the glass farms are no different than Kingsfield or Park Meadows or any of the other surrounding area. So it is suitable for housing development. Not suitable for huge houses or huge apartments, but it is suitable. So the, the village government is not a housing developer. I don't see the village government actually going out and building the housing. So we need to work with a developer or maybe developers. Uh, this is not going to be a one-shot deal. Uh, if we add, say, a hundred, throwing out a number, a hundred housing units, it would happen over a number of years. I think that the kind of housing we need, the most important housing we need is rental. We've not had any rental housing since Bill Brown, I think, built his, except for Green Metropolitan Housing. Uh, we need rental, all kinds of rental. We need rental for young adults. We need rental for modern income families. We need some higher income rental, but rental is especially important. Then I think we need moderate income housing, that middle in the donut. We have housing for lower income, and you can get grant money for lower income, and surely we need that. But it's much more difficult to build housing that moderate income people can afford. I mean, uh, $150,000 for a house that's in good shape, try and get that in Yellow Spring. That's really difficult. So, but that would be like probably $150,000 to $200,000 range would be what we would try to do. And if we can create a, a, a scale of housing, I'm hopeful that we can actually have some housing like that developed. Okay. So, great question. Um, <clears throat> we've looked at this, and at one point in time, and council was talking about 80% affordable housing home bank, <clears throat> there were numbers thrown around. And it, it's fine that we, we have a goal or we have something that we would hope that we get to. What we want to look at is that, I think we all said the village government is not in the land development. They're not into infrastructure, to putting the sewers, to putting the gas, to putting electric, water, all of that. They're not in that business. What we want to do is find a developer, use their expertise, just as Marianne said, we've all said, find their expertise. They know the business. They know 
what the marketability is. They know what the breakdown is going to be, if it's going to be afford what affordable housing is going to be, what mixed use housing, what market rate housing. They can find the blend on the glass farm. And the point being is, you want the glass farm to be sustainable. We're going to lay out the money. You're going to see the monies are going to go out, but we have to also look at the monies that are come in from the properties, from the from the potential uh, <coughs> payrolls, the income taxes. But we all these property taxes. We want to look at to see what is going to make it sustainable. Because the thing that we don't want to have happen is that the village is going to be upside down. If the glass farm is not a sustainable unit, for lack of better words, if it's not a sustainable unit, then we're going to the village is going to be upside down. And they're going to have to look for the monies. Okay, so how do they do that? Well, we don't want to subsidize it as residents. We don't want to be. We don't want to see a property tax hike. None of us want to see that. We're not affordable already. That's a net, the last thing that we want to see is that we're going to help pay for that particular parcel of land. So then it goes back to business again. What we've gone through. So those are the things that we want to look at that we want to concentrate is find the experts that can give us the proper blend that can make the glass farm sustainable. We all know what we need. We all know we want affordable housing. We just have to find that proper blend that's going to be, and that's where they let the experts do that. Not, I mean, we'll bid it out as a, as a village, but let them do the work. We may have goals, but our goals may not, not be realistic, and they can give us a realistic way of going and saying, this is how you can get to that. All we have time to do now is for me to read the rest of the questions to you. If candidates would like them, or if the media or the public would like them, they will, Karen McKee will have all of these questions and can provide them to you. What do you believe the Count Village Council's role is in supporting local nonprofit organizations? What's your position on village support for the Senior Citizen Center? Have you any ideas for the, how the village could better support or partner with the college? Do you have contingency plans for the Antioch assets? Should the future include the worst case? Would you 100% lo uh, support lowering the speed limit to 5 to 10 miles per hour in the nucleus and half mile radius of the village? We know that all homeowners pay property taxes. Now, don't you think they should have the right to vote on local issues regardless of their citizenship? Village staffing, do we have the right number of public work, safety, or other employees? Would you commit to passing budgets that are not deficit budgets? Yellow Springers are tree huggers, even to the extent of knitting for them. Uh, as our population ages, we could use some help with the leaves in the fall like other nearby communities. Are you interested in that? As the climate crisis deepens, what do you see as the role of the Village Council in dealing with what's coming? How will you use your leadership role to combat racism in the village? Uh, not one of you has mentioned the climate crisis, and what can we do about that? That's like the other one. If the next generation of voters is made of Greta Thunbergs and the Parkland kids, don't you think we should let them vote on the taxes they will have to pay? Sexual assault seems to be on the increase in the village. How will you interface with the police to solve the crimes and prioritize bringing predators to justice? Would you fund a community broadband? If you were elected, would you serve on various commissions? Are you in favor of reconsidering the decision to remove fluoride from our water? Should the village serve as an example to other communities in our region? How would you encourage that? And my favorite question of the evening, who is your favorite Avenger and why? <laughs> Let's acknowledge these candidates. Mucher, thank you for being so uh, polite and patient, and it is your time now. I'll take that mic back. If it didn't use up my whole three minutes, we should all get up and do jumping jacks for, uh, for three minutes, but uh, we will. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Karen, and the key organization for allowing me a couple of minutes to uh, give my view on the uh, Operation Pymie Township government.
a uh, quick overview of past, present, and future. Past uh, eight years, it's to no one's surprise that uh, Governor Kasich decided to balance the Ohio budget on the backs of the local government. And uh, we have struggled. We've actually had a shoestring uh, budget for the last eight years. Present. Um, I am very enthusi enthusi enthusiastically optimistic about our, um, our present condition. Our current administration has added a gas tax, which gives a, uh, a portion to townships, and it appears as though we're roughly going to get an additional uh, 50000 or so in uh, income off of that. And an additional small slice of local government tax is going to be returned to us. Uh, both things will help. Uh, it's going to allow us to maintain our roads, uh, our 15 miles of roads, uh, in better condition. Uh, it's going to allow us to purchase some uh, equipment that we've put off for the past few years that's, uh, that's overdue now. Um, so, as I say, I, I, I like the direction we're headed financially now. In the future, We've got uh, some interesting projects uh, in the works and some challenges. Challenges being to finish the new firehouse, which is just recently started to, to break ground, and it should be uh, finished by Labor Day next year. And I hope everybody will come to the ribbon cutting ceremony and we'll go through it and give fire truck rides and all kinds of good stuff. Um, and then there's the transition from the old station into the new one and what to do with the old station. Um, we're starting work on the potential of selling the old station to the newly formed CDC, which would give more freedom for its uh, eventual use, um, the control of its eventual use. As I'm sure you know, a township cannot sell property to an individual. Uh, it has to be done by uh, sealed bids or by auction. So having a CDC control it, uh, I think, is one of the better ways to go. Um, the the uh, one of the challenges that I'm not looking forward to is the eventual replacement of our uh, long-term fire chief, Colin Altman, who intends on retiring uh, this July. Um, so we will have to start a process for his replacement, and it's going to be a difficult uh, replacement to do, but we'll figure it out. Um, another interesting project that we have in the future uh, is we're going to have an addition onto our natural burial cemetery. Uh, it's going to be an oak grove, and basically what it will do is it will allow for 40 white oak trees to be planted, uh, and they would be planted um, over the remains of the person who purchased or is buried in the grave. Um, <laughs> right, Roger? Yeah, Roger says it's going to work. Um, and then there'll be a memorial on the tree as it grows and lives for a couple hundred years uh, as a uh, testament to the, uh, to the person who the, the tree is buried on. So I think that's an interesting project that we are going to try and uh, flesh out in the next year or two. Um, this is my seventh election, uh, and somebody once said, and I forgot who it was, but when asked, why do you keep running for election, for re-election? And the answer to that, which I like the answer, is I'm not running to be re-elected, I'm running to do a job. Um, and that's what I've done since 1996. Uh, I've done the job of a township trustee, a township administrator. Uh, at this point, I'm fortunate that I know what the job entails and that I have the energy to, uh, to do the job and I still enjoy doing it. So, uh, thank you for your attention and um, everybody vote. Everybody vote. Not only should everybody vote, but everybody should write questions for, for Chris. We, we, we have one question. 
Will the firehouse come in under budget? <laughs> as, we, as we speak today, yes. Uh, it was 9,000, the bid came in, the final bid, um, for all the trades came in $9,000 under the maximum estimated amount that we were allowed to award. That max, ma, maximum estimated amount also includes a $281,000 contingency that, of course, you don't know what's going to happen, but we hope we won't be using that money or we won't be using too much of that money, uh, in which case it would be more than $9,000 under budget. Um, but there's lots of things that it needs on the interior after it's, after it's built. So uh, we're, not, we're probably not going to give uh, the USDA too much money back. Will you acknowledge Chris Butcher for Carol, this never happens in Yellow Springs, but tonight it's happening, so get up here to do your benediction. Uh, I want to thank all the candidates, all the people who came, particularly those of you that have double-dipped, uh, having gone to the Vernay EPA uh, meeting that started at 5. Uh, and so, Karen, I'll bring you the mic, and you can close it up. Absolutely. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Dirk. All right, again, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, before you leave, there are um, literature. There is literature on the table in the back that each candidate has brought. Please feel free to um, take a look at that. You can have individual conversations with candidates by getting their literature and getting their contact information. We also have cookies that <laughs> were made by one of the members of the uh, McKee Association. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge those members that are here. Missy Miller, um, thank you for her cookies. Uh, Chris Anderson and Dan Craigan are here. Our uh, video person is uh, Paul Adedroff. And our timekeeper was um, Bob Harris and Suzanne Patterson. So I want to thank everybody again for coming again. There is information about the McKee Association. We are a community-based organization, and what our goal is is to bring information to the community. Every fourth Wednesday, we have what we call a community conversation. And some of the questions that did not get addressed this evening, we can translate those into a community conversation. So I uh, look forward to seeing you guys again, and thank you.